Hi, thanks for watching. Okay, so in this video, I'd like to try to sort of summarize everything. Um, I tend to be kind of long-winded. All right, so in this video, I just want to try to tightly summarize what I think is the most realistic uh, sentencing, sentencing outcome in the two pending criminal cases against Alaska Captain uh, Joseph Emerson. Okay, uh, Joseph Emerson, um, for anybody who doesn't know, he's the Alaska captain who was uh, jump seating on Horizon 2059. And uh, in mid-flight, uh, he tried to grab the, uh, the uh, fire handles, basically, to, that would not only shut off uh, both engines, but also maybe blow the bottles, the fire suppression bottles, to both engines in this uh, Embraer 175. So that could have been dangerous, right? And I think it's, it's reasonable for him to be uh, at least uh, charged with attempted murder. I mean, he's not going to get that, right? I mean, I'll explain that. But uh, it's reasonable to charge him with attempted murder. And um, anyway, I just like to use this video just as a way to sort of just summarize basically how I look at this case uh, as a lawyer. OK, I, I, I used to be a pilot. I used to be a commercial pilot. And I also had um, honestly, I had some psych psychological issues and, and I no longer fly. OK, so this kind of hits close to home for me. And I, I've been working in uh, federal criminal defense for about uh, about 11, 12 years uh, now. Okay, so um, so I have experience, uh, done lots of sentencing, okay, and I know how criminal sentencing works, right? So um, so I'd like to try to give my best uh, summary, um, you know, as to how I think this is going to, not just in sentencing, but how I think this whole thing is going to is going to is going to cash out for uh, for uh, Mr. Emerson. Okay, so. Um, I think in terms of the whole outcome, I think this is definitely more of a psychiatric case than it is a criminal case. And I'll explain. I'll explain that. OK, so basically, um, I've heard a lot of pundits talking about how the insanity defense is off the table because there was voluntary uh, intoxication. Right. Because he took the magic mushrooms 48 hours prior. OK, I don't think I'm sorry. I, I don't think it's that simple. I don't think it's that simple because I don't think that. I don't think they're going to prove, or at least I think there's going to be a big debate between the experts, and there's going to be experts in this case if if they don't plea out early, right? So assuming they don't plea out early, there's going to be a bunch of experts in this case, okay? And I think there is room to argue, and I think there's room for experts to, to submit opinions to the effect that the psychotic break wasn't just purely the high off the mushrooms, okay? Um, Maybe we will find out that enough time had lapsed since he had taken the mushrooms, okay, that what he was experiencing was not just the pure high of the mushroom, just like sometimes when people have very delicate personalities or they're, they're like on the verge of a, of a nervous breakdown, you could just smoke a little bit of marijuana and you could end up having a psychotic break, okay, and the psychotic break is not the high of the marijuana, right? That's the psychotic break that's produced by smoking the marijuana is not necessarily the high of the THC, right? It could be that the THC uh, was like a trigger for what was already waiting to happen, or you were sort of already on the edge of a nervous breakdown, right? So in some cases, you can have the voluntary intoxication, and then you have sort of like domino effects, where one of those domino effects is that you end up triggering your own your own uh, psychotic episode, right? So that you're legitimately psychotic and the psychosis is not precisely the high of the drug, okay? It's sort of a knock-on, sort of a domino effect, a triggered effect uh, from the drug. So I think in that situation, I think there's at least room to still talk about the insanity defense, right? And I think um, if I were an attorney, I would at least have it on as a bargaining chip, knowing that I may lose it, but it's still a heavy bargaining chip and I think, uh, you know, Oregon and the federal courts, they have to decide how much money do they want to throw at this case, right? Do you want to throw up to like hundreds of thousands of dollars when it's not even like this guy is not even like, I'm sorry, he's not a bad person. I'm, I'm sorry to say this. This guy is clearly not a bad person, right? He did a bad thing. And, uh, you know, I watched the Todd Grande, the Dr. Grande analysis, and he just he always routinely he just confines himself to the worst part of the, the criminal act. And then with no consideration, he just kind of gets locked into this idea. Well, he tried to kill people. So, well, the, the actual circumstances, when you look at the whole circumstances, I'm sorry to say this. OK, I think he didn't really fully know what he was doing. He knew he, he's been around cockpits for decades. This guy's been around cockpits. He's, he's a captain. He's has 
maybe he maybe has maybe um, 15,000 hours of flight time or more, right? And so he's so comfortable in a cockpit that even when he's, he's uh, let's say, having a nervous breakdown, he still knows, he knows basically where, where the, the emergency shutoff, uh, you know, the fire handles are. He knows that. But I don't think he had full awareness of what he was doing, right? Because in, with the same brain, and just a few minutes later, when he went back to the cockpit, uh, when he went back to the cabin, you know, to be sat down in the back with the flight attendants, right? Apparently, he had tried to open uh, an emergency door while they were at altitude, right? Now, anybody with any experience, uh, you know, like to the level of being a captain, an airline captain, knows that at altitude, he cannot possibly open those doors, right? Uh, there's just too much pressurization. And so what that suggests to me is that he had like enough, he had enough residual sense of, you know, orientation in the airplane to know where things were and to roughly understand where things were, but he didn't have the full appreciation of what he was doing. Right. So I think we're looking at a reduced capacity um, to where he didn't really fully understand. And so this is going to, uh, this is going to affect maybe not, not to the, okay. Okay. I understand the insanity defense is 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 kind of shaky because it's going to depend depend on how much we can attribute the psychosis directly to the intoxication versus sort of a a triggered event where the a sort of a triggered event a, a triggered psychosis where the voluntary intoxication was one of several contributing factors right so it's not just the high of the drug right so basically um you know, you have to, I mean, at least as a lawyer and working, you know, someone I have experience doing sentencing, right? Um, as I analyze this case, um, the, the I, I see room for an insanity defense as, as a bargaining chip, but even if the insanity defense is not on the table, right? I think he was still impaired to a point that you could try to negate one of the elements of the crime, which is the, the intentionality, right? Because it, Oregon, uh, the, He's charged with uh, attempted second degree murder. So in Oregon, uh, second degree murder is an intentional, um, except with one exception with certain vulnerable victims. But generally, second degree murder is, is, is more or less an intentional crime. So I think that um, you can attack the intentionality, right? And I think through and, and OK, even though Oregon does have the voluntary intoxication statute, right? Um, that just means you can't assert the blanket insanity defense, right? If it is proven that the disability is completely the result of the intoxication, as opposed to just one of many, as opposed to the intoxication just being one of several triggers, right? So if you can prove that the that the uh, that the insanity was triggered in part by the mushrooms, but it wasn't just fully explained by the mushrooms. Well, then I think the insanity defense is still on the table. But if for whatever reason, if the if the state were to succeed in proving that it's just 100 percent the magic mushrooms and nothing else. Well, even then, you can still use um, the voluntary intoxication, not as a blanket, not as a blanket uh, insanity defense, but you can use it to attack offense elements except for recklessness. OK. And so the intentionality that's inherent to uh, second degree murder in Oregon. Well, I think it's on the table. Even, you know, it's still on the table, even if you can prove it's all just voluntary intoxication. Right. OK. So basically, um, you may not you may or may not have an insanity defense, depending on what the experts say. And, that, and I'm saying this right. Um, yes, he did voluntarily take mushrooms, but it was 48 hours prior. We don't know the dosage. We don't know his blood level yet. OK, um, it may be just like sometimes when you take marijuana, you know, and you take the marijuana and it produces a secondary psychotic uh, situation where the marijuana was just one of several contributing factors. I think you could still argue that his psychosis wasn't 100 percent the high or the effect of the actual magic mushroom. OK, so I think that leaves open the insanity defense. But, you know, even if you lost that you can still attack the intentionality. So I think this is a case that's sort of plea bargaining in the direction of, it's going to negotiate in the direction of, um, well, it would negotiate in the direction of manslaughter, but I think they would end up pleading out probably at reckless endangerment. That's that's how I see it, you know? And even if it was manslaughter, um, attempted manslaughter, I mean, I don't know. I think, to be honest, I think the defense would still hold the insanity on the table as a bargaining chip. And I think they would just sort of, Ask the ask Oregon. Do you really want to spend millions of dollars to make a big a big show trial out of a manslaughter case? It doesn't make sense. 
right? So I think that with a good attorney, it depends on the skill of the attorney, but if he has a very good attorney, this gets bargained at reckless endangerment with heavy, heavy psychiatric uh, probation, right? So it'd be a probation with major psychiatric conditions, okay? Um, now, technically, you know, if you had a really good attorney and if you really wanted to be very risky, I mean, very risky, you could just go all the way and just go all the way to trial, just trying to assert the insanity defense. But I think that, um, I think there is some risk that it would be found that, um, and even though I don't agree with it, I don't agree with it, but there's some risk that a court would find that his uh, psychosis was only the result of the magic mushrooms. Now, again, I don't agree with that, but when you do litigation, you, you, you're you like playing poker basically. And so like, I don't agree that, I don't agree that really it was purely voluntary intoxication. I think he had his own psychiatric um, vulnerabilities. And I think the magic mushrooms just sort of were a trigger that resulted in more dominoes falling that included just a major, just a basic a nervous breakdown. Okay, but you know, I could be wrong. And, uh, you know, you don't want to gamble too much when you're litigating, right? So I would think that they would probably bluff a little bit and they would probably push hard against the state, you know, suggesting they're going for the insanity defense. But that's just a way of bargaining them down, even outside, even bargaining them down, even from manslaughter, attempted manslaughter, right? Down to something like reckless endangerment, right? Where it would just be an easy plea bargain. And uh, maybe you could set conditions where he has to have, have a lot of psychiatric follow-up or community service. So that's how the that's how the Oregon State case will will res- will turn out. I believe that's that's the outcome we can expect. As far as the federal, okay, it's a, a little different because the federal voluntary intoxication law is a little bit different. And okay, I would still use the argument that he could still potentially have an insanity defense just because I don't think the magic mushroom is 100% responsible for his psychosis, okay? Just given the time between actually taking the drug and the actual mental incident, and just the fact that, um, you know, they probably took some, maybe did some laboratory work so they can maybe analyze whether, you know, I don't know. I think good psychologists could, could put on paper a good opinion suggesting that he had his own susceptibilities and he was, he basically... You could say that the uh, the magic mushrooms were just a contributing uh, a contributing trigger, but not the actual cause of the psycho, not the not the entire cause of the psychosis, just one of several triggers, right? So, um, so I think the you know it, it would not be frivolous to to at least hold as a bargaining chip, you know, the idea in federal court of the insanity defense, but more than likely, you know, like the Plan B or the you know I guess yeah the Plan B. You know, if you lose that argument, then you're under the, the voluntary intoxication umbrella. OK, now in federal court, voluntary intoxication does not work with general intent crimes, okay? only with specific intent crimes. Right. So now in federal court, he's charged with the crime of interfering with a flight crew. OK, now that happens to be a general intent crime. OK, so I guess, you know, plan A. Plan A would be um, you try to assert uh, an insanity defense and you just try to work with that causation. You try to say that the psychedelic mushrooms were just one of many, many triggers for this psychotic episode. OK, um, you try to win that. But plan B, it turns out it's going to be voluntary intoxication. OK, so then uh, with interference with flight crew, since that's a general intent crime, you're probably not going to win that. OK, you're probably going to have to plead guilty. Right. But then you go to the sentencing guidelines. Right. Right. Now, in the sentencing guidelines, they have two tiers for interfering with flight crew, right? So in the federal sentencing guidelines, the top tier is like like five and a half years. It would basically be you're looking at like five and a half years in prison. Okay, if you intentionally, you know, and you have to prove the intentionality, um, do something that puts the the aircraft at risk, right? Um, The other tier is if you do something reckless, right? Now, generally, the way the law works is when you have voluntary intoxication, you can use that to defeat intentionality, but not recklessness. That's just kind of the rough. That's just roughly the way the the law works. So more than likely, um, the defense would succeed in knocking out the top tier of the of the intentional. And so you're you're now at the second tier of the federal sentencing guidelines where you're dealing with, you know, putting the aircraft in danger um, through recklessness. Okay, and you can't really defeat that with voluntary intoxication. So. I would say he's looking at uh, this, the bottom tier of the sentencing guidelines for interference with a flight crew. And that would be roughly a year and a half. You know, I would say roughly a year and a half of prison time. But here's the thing in federal court. If you have someone who has zero criminal history, zero criminal history, has an excellent reputation in the community. 
who has an excellent personality and excellent uh, job record and all that, um, more than likely the court is going to give him a substantial downward variance from the guidelines. Okay. And so um, you start at like say a year and a half exposure for the interference with flight crew, but then you bargain it down to like say a, um, like a 12 month downward variance. So basically time served, right? So it's basically almost no prison time. It would just be, you probably just give him time served and maybe put him again on a very substantial uh, a probation package. Right. And uh, anyway, so, the bottom line is, I think, uh, you know, between the Oregon case and I think the federal case, I think he'll probably just end up with a, a probation package if he doesn't press the insanity defense. Now, you know, because there was some drugs involved, there's some risk involved with the insanity, right? Where there is a chance that he's not going to get that that blanket insanity defense in either Oregon or the federal courts, right? And so if that's the case, um, I would say a good attorney would tell him you're better off plea bargaining because if you try to press the insanity, I mean, it would be great if you win, but if you lose, it could be, you know, maybe doing a little more prison time than what you want. So um, I guess if I was an attorney, I would encourage him just to accept the fact that there was some drugs involved and he's just going to have to face that, that that complicates his insanity defense. You know, it's not, the, it's not off the table. It's just that it, it adds more risk of uh, just, maybe just having bad luck with the judge or bad luck, you know, with the jury, if that's, if the jury's involved in it. So I would say, um, you know, I would, I would encourage him to just take an excellent plea bargain, but using the insanity defense as a bargaining chip. In other words, you would bluff, you would bluff the prosecutors by just going balls out with the insanity and getting a ton of psychiatric evaluations and all kinds of, you know, really, really uh, expensive uh, psychiatric uh, experts basically to really push the, what looks like going to be an insanity defense, you know, just saying that, Hey, you can't prove that this psychotic break was a hundred percent, the result of the magic mushrooms. Okay. And so you use that as a bargaining chip. And then what you're doing is you're forcing Oregon to, to ask itself, are we going to spend, you know, multi-million dollars prosecuting, prosecuting this case to just get what a, a manslaughter? Cause that's the most they could get, you know, they're not going to get murder. They're not going to get attempted murder. So would Oregon want to spend millions and millions of dollars just to technically get him, uh, you know, a conviction on manslaughter and then and then have what, maybe two years of appeals where maybe the appellate court could turn it over? I mean, I'm telling you, Oregon will not spend that money on a guy who has such a good reputation, who apparently is such a nice person. They're not going to spend millions and millions of dollars trying to get uh, manslaughter on this guy. It's just it's not going to happen economically. It, it won't happen. So, um, so I think this is going to end up, if, if I were his defense attorney, I, I would use the, the threat of an insanity defense with major, you know, and I, I would just get major uh, expensive psychiatric experts involved and just use that as, a, as like a threat, as like a bluff to basically bluff Oregon down to reckless endangerment with a really nice uh, probation package, you know, um, and possibly even um, a diversion. They have diversion programs where you can defer, you can defer adjudication um, and basically just have him complete the, the probation. And if he does the probation, they even they'll even just drop the charges, you know. So uh, they have all these deferred, you know, these like deferred probation things. So um, it, it all depends on the on the skill of the attorneys. But if he has good attorneys, um, I think he could end up basically just almost doing no time in jail, uh, except for maybe time served. Okay. Now, you know, if he ends up doing six months, you know, but, but like a year or less, let's say a year or less and potentially just nothing more than time served. Okay. But this will definitely be, if not an insanity defense, it, it may be bluffed as an insanity defense. Okay. That would be the bluff, but the actual, the actual play is going to be a, a mental health defense, not, you know, Mental health defense and insanity defense, they're not quite the same, but this is going to be a mental health defense. Basically, um, I guarantee you that the only way this can work is you got to get some very good psychiatrists, very good psychologists to just completely evaluate this guy and demonstrate that there's major doubt as to whether his psychotic break is only the result of the magic mushrooms. Okay. And that's kind of the play. You, you, you're trying to shoot for insanity, but you're using that to bargain basically to get uh, Oregon to go down to reckless endangerment. They're not going to spend millions of dollars to try to prove manslaughter, attempted manslaughter. That's, it's not going to happen. So then um, as far as the federal, you know, kind of the same thing, using uh, the, the threat of an insanity defense as a way of bargaining them just to uh, maybe come to a plea agreement in, in the federal case 
and then uh, where the state, where the the United States, the the federal government would recommend um, jointly with the defense, you know, a very lenient sentence, maybe just probation um, or time served or whatever. And so anyway, so the last 10 minutes of this video, like, okay, because I have been a pilot, all right, I used to be a, a, a professional pilot and a flight instructor. And because I also have had, you know, mental issues, it's very embarrassing, I'll be honest. Um, you know, I have a lot of feelings about this case. All right. Um, and you know, I have mixed feelings about this because I actually, even though it doesn't favor me, okay, because I have had mental issues, I actually do think that, um, the FAA and the airline should be very strict, very, very strict about mental issues. Okay. I do think that having serious depression, like what, uh, Joseph Emerson had, he had serious depression. I do think that should be a disqualifier. I don't, I don't think people who have had serious depression should be allowed to, to fly, at least not to fly passengers, okay, not to fly airlines. I mean, I know people are going to disagree, and I, I apologize. It's just my opinion, but I just think um, even though I understand, you know, maybe nine out of 10 people, maybe eight out of 10 people who have serious depression, maybe with the right treatment, you know, theoretically, they could get back in the cockpit and it's not a problem. But I think that... Um, I don't know if it's worth it to risk maybe the two out of 10 where it could actually compromise, um, you know, the effectiveness of a person's ability to operate in the cockpit. In other words, do you really want to take the, the edge off of a, a professional whose job it is to hold hundreds of lives in their hands? OK, and so I think the problem here is that. Um, you're dealing with people like, say, pilots, there's tons of pilots out there and it is known it's already been studied that a lot of pilots do have depression, okay? Or at least, I'm not gonna say it's a huge amount, but there is a, 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 there is a substantial percentage, let's say some small percentage, but it's a real percentage of pilots who may struggle with depression, but they don't feel like they can go to get real therapy because they'd have to report that uh, on their FAA questionnaires when they get their medical certificates, okay? So the problem is, is that, um, Pilots understand that even just just going to see a therapist for depression could potentially cost them their their whole career. OK, they could lose their whole career. So I know it's a problem. All right. And I know that there's almost no incentive right now for anybody to be honest. OK, there's just no incentive. OK, so I think that, um, you know, unless any unless something has changed in the system. All right. The system, maybe the way the airlines function, maybe the way the way the FAA functions, maybe there could be um, like a pension fund like and I think there should be a disability fund where you you define disability different for pilots. In other words, if a pilot has, let's say, just what, what in the ordinary world would be just like a moderate depression okay, in the pilot world that would qualify you, I hopefully, you know, in some ideal world, that would qualify you for an excellent disability package, plus maybe an excellent program to maybe uh, re-educate those people to get them into another line of work, okay? Maybe maybe aviation related, but just not on the front of the line where you, where you could be uh, causing danger to people, you know? So, um, so basically, um, I think maybe the present system the problem is, is that, you know, just mentioning mental illness could potentially cost you your livelihood. So we need to change the system so that people do not feel they're going to pay a penalty. OK, by disclosing uh, a mental illness, I think we should reward people who are able to disclose their personal struggles. OK, reward them very generously so that you take away, at least take away for some people, take away that 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 in that that um, that inhibition. Yeah, because right now, uh, basically pilots, sorry, my neighbor's dogs, it's, it's horrible. Anyway, um, I don't know what to do. My neighbor's dogs are just crazy. Anyway, just we need to we need to change the system to take away the, the things that make pilots uh, reluctant, that make them reluctant to reveal th mental issues that could disqualify them from being uh, from having their career. Basically, take, it could it could uh, kill their career. And so. Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, un until they until they change the system to allow pilots to be rewarded for for revealing and disclosing their personal psychiatric issues. OK, I don't think we're going to see any changes. I think we're going to see people just struggling privately with their depressions and some of them will have little meltdowns. And by the way, it's not just this case and it's not just the German wings and it's not just the JetBlue 191. We've, we've seen other issues. You know, some pilots, maybe they drink a little too much. Some pilots may show up with a little residual blood alcohol level and they know they know they're risking it. 
you know, and, and we see this happening maybe eight times a year, eight or 10 times a year. We see this. Um, and how many others do not, do not get caught. Right. So, I mean, we know this is happening. We know there's probably some percentage of pilots who just carry a depression and they're not going to see anybody. They're not going to talk to anybody because they don't want to risk their career, you know? And the bottom line is, you know, already, um, you know, we're starting to see a lot of incidents in airports, like busy airports where there's confusion. Maybe, maybe ATC gives a, an ambiguous instruction, or maybe the, the flight crew misinterprets a taxi instruction. I mean, just, there's been several of these incidents just in the last year or so. You know, I, I, one of the ones that scared me the most is American Airlines, a 777, um, taxiing at JFK, and they got confused. They were told to cross one runway, and they took a different turn and crossed a different runway while Delta was taking off, right? And Delta had reached about 100 knots when, thank God, they saw this, seven, this 777 crossing right in front of them. And I'm sorry, that could have been a terrible, that could have been a terrible incident. And so, you know, already we're in a situation where there's distraction, there's, there's, there's errors being made uh, between ATC and flight crews and, uh, you know, other loss of separation incidents, you know, at busy airports and stuff. And just to, to throw into the mix, the fact that there's some percentage of pilots that are maybe struggling with anxiety, depression, or just insecurities, just, just basic stuff, you know, and we have to decide, you know, what percentage of that stuff can we allow to be rehabilitated, you know, subject to re rehabilitation, and then which of it has to be disqualifying, you know, and in my opinion, like serious depression, and I, and I think this guy Emerson, I think he was so depressed, he was willing to basically do something very self-destructive before he even got to that flight, before he got to the horizon 2059, okay, two days prior, he was willing to take magic mushrooms, okay, not knowing how it would affect him, right? And knowing that just taking those those drugs would have really jeopardized, um, you know, let's say if he if let's say he went on to captain another flight for Alaska, right? And he was putting question marks and putting his whole his whole life and the lives of other passengers potentially just by taking those magic mushrooms. He had no idea if that would affect his ability to captain a flight or if maybe he could have a sudden mental breakdown while he was captaining a flight, just like happened with Clayton Osborn in uh, JetBlue 191. All right. He, there was actual JetBlue 191 that captain actually had a nervous breakdown in flight. You don't need, we don't need to have those situations. Right. And so um, I'm saying that even just by taking the magic mushrooms, I think Emerson was doing something in such terrible judgment. That was terrible judgment. That shows that his depression got to a point where I think it was a disqualifying depression. In other words, the depression got so serious, it was causing behaviors that could be very threatening, very life-threatening, both to himself and to how, who knows how many passengers. Okay, so I really think that, um, you know, I, on the one hand, I hate to say it, but I think there are some levels of mental, um, you know, psychiatric, psychological issues that I think should disqualify people. However, at the same time, we need to make the the packages, the, the the disability packages so generous and so rewarding of people who come out and disclose. OK, and, you know, maybe it's not just the money. Maybe there should be set up, like, say, a system of former pilots who help um, who dedicate themselves full time to working in outreach like like mental health outreach to other pilots right to where they can have like say uh confidential coaching sessions that are not therapy sessions and they could the faa could agree that those are not reportable you know um and so you know to basically create maybe a place where former pilots can go when they are become when they become psychologically disqualified where they they can actually be full-time employed let's say in some kind of mental outreach uh you know for other pilots where they can have a sense of purpose and not not be let's say banished from aviation they could still be you know in some way still attached to aviation or still associated with aviation you know so maybe like mental health outreach for for pilots um and also a generous reward for being honest you know so that so that so they, they they're not losing their livelihood you know and at the same time maybe holding penalties for pilots who maintain their dishonesty okay and maybe change the FAA questionnaires to be a little more incisive um, so that when you try to get your class one uh, medical, you have to really disclose, you know, and if you and if, if there's any, you know, real dishonesty about your mental status, you know, that you're going to get the opposite of that generosity. So so that the basically the system would be there to incentivize a lot of disclosure, even at the cost of losing your career. 
because they would have excellent disability packages and maybe alternative careers for pilots who have to separate because of psychological issues. You know, I mean, it's the best I can come up with, but you know, anyway, I really appreciate your patience and thanks for watching.